Good evening, good afternoon, whatever you are around the world following ISOJ 2021. Welcome back. Um, we have about uh, 7,200, 7,200 people registered for ISOJ from about uh, 134 countries. So it's really amazing our, our outreach some people are not uh, being able to to watch um, uh, live, but you know you know that all the videos are staying on 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 YouTube, so you can follow it or uh, uh, later, or you can go back and check out some something interesting that you have uh, seen. So um, I also hope you you have been enjoying the Wonder Room where we are trying to to. Uh, revive this experience of any conference that you, after the after the session you can you can meet people and and start a, com a conversation find old friends and new new friends etc but talking about cool things um this panel is really cool i, I mean we I, I have been doing this for 22 years and we we always have uh, you know some new tech technologies, new ways of storytelling. So the the next panel is immersive journal journalism. How pho photogrammetry, VR and AR are adding new dimensions to storytelling. So um, I would like to in, in, to invite uh, my friend Robert Hernandez, a, a professor of professional practice at the University of Southern California to lead this, this panel in, this, in the same brilliant way as he did in previous uh, very cool panels about uh, uh, AR and, and VR. Robert Hernandez, please.
Hola a todos, bienvenido a ISAG 2021, una conferencia que es internacional y los que se recuerden quién soy, me llamo Roberto Hernández, soy profesor del periodismo digital aquí en Los Ángeles, en la Universidad del Sur de California y es tradición que yo comienzo mi sesión en español porque este es internacional y los que no hablan español se están poniendo pánicos, no se preocupen, I speak English. It's a tradition for me to start my ISOC sessions whenever I've been invited by Rosenthal and team to do my session, to kick it off in Spanish, to remind us all that this is an international conference. It is one of the best conferences uh, that I ever attend, and it's always a pleasure to be here. I'm Robert Hernandez. I'm a digital journalism professor here in Los Angeles at USC, University of Southern California. And today I'm your moderator, uh, talking about and exploring the concept of storytelling through photogrammetry, volumetric. Now, some of you may know those terms, some of you may not, um, but we'll talk about these different things together and at the end, go into a costume change and answer your questions live. But for now, you guys know the, the um, format. Uh, each speaker is going to present and I too am going to present, if you allow me just a few minutes. I wanna share my experience Uh, that happened to me not too long ago. So uh, here we go, sharing my screen. All right, so uh, I want to tell you a story of what happened last month when I saw this tweet. Now, you're looking at this, and let me tell you, yes, that is extremely violent and scary. This is an independent game developer that created a virtual reality, I'm gonna call it a murder simulator. Now it is grotesque and messed up. Uh, the creator himself, when they tweeted it out, said this is, this is a very, very violent stress test and I admit I worried myself even a little bit on this one. Let's put that violence aside for one second and acknowledge how incredible it is in virtual reality to create these types of physics and experiences. But we can't ignore the violence that's there. That is something that is dominant in immersive virtual reality, all right, these games. And so what I did was I quote tweeted it and said, this is the future of VR if we don't bring in more diverse creators. I put that tweet out into the world, went on with my day and actually forgot about it until 18 hours later when, oh boy, did I anger a lot of developers. Now I'm gonna spare you all the vitriol, the trolling, that I got. The one point I would agree with is I did not mean to drag this independent game developer um, who did incredible work. Not the type of content I'm interested in, but incredible work nonetheless. But I wanna remind people in the industry and even outside looking into this space that most of this stuff, most of the VR video games that are successful and, and getting a lot of money are first person shooters. Here's just a couple of them. Now, video games are amazing. Half-Life is an incredible experience in game. But, you know, and, and here's one you might have recognized. It's called Medal of Honor, which was really popular in a controller setting when you would fight in World War II. Here, it's done in virtual reality. So you're not using a controller, you're using your hands. You're catching that grenade. You're holding the gun. And at the end there, you're throwing that pan. But when I saw the original video, they weren't throwing a pan. They were throwing a knife. They were throwing a knife at a Nazi. In virtual reality, you don't play, like I said, with a controller. So how else do you use that knife? You literally are gonna walk up to a Nazi and stab them, physically moving your body in to do that. That is not what this industry can be and should be or limited to. So I responded to my tweet and said that let's not kid ourselves. There are too many murder simulators that are out there. And in my main point is we need diverse creators, not just diversity in terms of gender, LGBTQ, um, uh, people of color, Although there is an overlap of those types of point of views doing more than first person shooters, but they don't have exclusivity into that. We need storytellers of all types to step in and to produce these experiences. I do this with my students. We produce under the name Javernalism. 
We've worked with different tech companies, media companies. We do stories about homelessness, used in foster care, deportees. We're in post-production on a story about surviving domestic abuse. And we too use these technologies like photogrammetry to create AR experiences. This is one, for example, where we captured a homeless dwelling, Jennifer's tent, and through photogrammetry, and I'll explain what that is in a little bit, created not a, 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 an artist's interpretation of her home, but a photogrammetry-based model of her home that you can interact with and most importantly, step inside, right? This isn't about shooting. This isn't about fighting zombies or Nazis. This is about harnessing that technology to create experiences that connect us, right? You can learn more about our work. We have apps and all that stuff. But my point for this quick intro moderator talk uh, is to say that we need you. You're gonna hear from a variety of different creators here from big name, incredible organizations or tech companies, but you're gonna hear by independent uh, freelancers, independent journalists, as well as educators to remind you that you can be creating these stories. And quite honestly, we need you to be creating these stories. So we're not limited to murder simulators. Okay, that was my little talk, my PSA rant. Now I wanna talk about some of the terms you're gonna hear. Photogrammetry, what is it? There's a big umbrella. This is my interpretation. and Maybe my colleagues will correct my grammar there. Uh, this is fluid language and lingo in this industry that is growing and going. But I, we're gonna talk about what's called volumetric capture, capturing in 3D. Photogrammetry, which is in the title of this project, is about using a series of photographs on a static object or room, and then converting those photographs into a 3D model. Here was our first tent that we did, 100 photos on my old uh, camping tent that I brought to campus. We took 100 pictures of it, ran it through some software called Caption Reality, and poof, that is our 3D model. This technology though, which seems out of reach perhaps to you, is actually more accessible than ever before. Um, and it's evolving quickly. Videogrammetry is another uh, volumetric approach where instead of static, images capturing a static object, it's video capturing an object that is moving and it's producing holograms, right? Legit holograms of people moving in 3D space as a 3D experience. Holograms is the term that's used. It's, it's not a 3D model, it's not an artist's interpretation, it is the person captured in a hologram. The other technology is called LiDAR. LiDAR is like radar, but it's using light. And usually that's really expensive. But if you've been paying attention, LiDAR is now in uh, iPad Pros and on the uh, latest version of the iPhone. LiDAR, something that usually costs tens of thousands of dollars, is included in your phone for free now. For free. It's an expensive phone nonetheless. These technologies are going to be going more mainstream and we're making these tools accessible to everybody, including you. And so be aware of these new shifts in technologies and start thinking about how might you use these to tell stories. Lots of things to capture today. And the first one up is Thomas from Sketchfab. Sketchfab, I consider the, the Instagram uh, Instagram for 3D models. That's how I describe it to, to people. It's an incredible platform that gets better and better. Thomas, thank you for joining us. Take it away. Thank you, Robert. Yeah, so um, I work primarily with cultural heritage organizations, um, helping them make the most of their 3D scans and publishing them online, prepping them for online, um, as well as with the wider Sketchfab community, which includes uh, a diverse uh, bunch of creators uh, creating all kinds of things. So. Um, I'm going to be talking a lot about what other people are doing, what they're publishing on Sketchfab rather than my, my own work. For anyone that's not familiar, Sketchfab is a place to find, publish, and freely distribute and sell 3D models online. This is a, a view of uh, just some of the recent uploads to the platform, very diverse content. Um, and once you upload a 3D model onto the platform, you can adjust uh, and style it uh, in different ways using kind of the, the backend tools that Sketchfab provides. This is a, a 3D scan from the British Museum of the Pacific Island God R. And then 
when you're happy with it, you can publish it and then you can embed that 3D model on a web page the same way you would an image or a video. And as Robert says, if it helps, you can, you can think of Sketchfab as the YouTube or the Instagram for 3D content. Um, being able to um, add things to your 3D models, so uh, other kinds of content, so text and, and audio in, in these examples, annotations and 3D sounds allow people to create um, uh, what I'm calling object-based narratives. They're, they're very, can be very simple, but they can still tell a story. Um, the first example there with the sound adding audio to a reconstruction of a historic locomotive. And then uh, this is uh, behind the scenes of a, a USA Today uh, piece about a landfill in Chicago. Um, so as Robert says, um, 3D capture technology, namely cameras and photogrammetry software and scanning apps for smart devices have made quick, simple 3D capture a possibility. So on the left here, photogrammetry, discrete images um, that you then process into a 3D model. And then on the other side, a much more kind of, I guess, fluid uh, capture live as you're waving your phone around in front of this, this mural capturing the, the 3D form there. Um, I also want to give a, a kind of idea of trends that we're seeing uh, with uploads on, on Sketchfab. So Sketchfab has a community of about 5 million members um, from, from brands, cultural organizations to individual artists and individual 3D scanning enthusiasts. And here I've just mapped um, weekly uploads um, for photogrammetry um, based 3D models uh, for the last six months. And across that, I've, I've added um, iOS LiDAR uploads. So there are several different apps for the, the iPhone that uh, make use of the LiDAR scanning that uh, we're seeing uh, an increase, a trend in um, 3D models being uploaded every day from what you might term casual 3D scanning enthusiasts. And that affects, I think, the, the ease of capture, affects the kind of things that people might tackle or want to capture because um, they're capturing data with just their, their smartphones. Um, in general, um, the two workflows produce um, quite different results in terms of perceived quality. Um, however, what smart devices, um, the scanning apps lack in 3D scan fidelity, they, they make up for in uh, the simplicity and speed of capture process. And plus, there are people just walking around with a 3D scanner in their pocket now, so they, they can start scanning anytime, any place. As 3D workflows become more intuitive and less uh, specialized, then more people are discovering the medium uh, as a way of capturing and sharing their surroundings and what they're doing. Um, in a process of timely, serendipitous, and, and niche 3D publishing. So with these workflows, you can follow a recipe in 3D. You can explore a 3D scan of the, I'm going to get the name wrong, Geldingalur um, uh, volcano in Iceland. Um, an annotated tour of that was uploaded to Sketchfab a few days after the volcano began erupting um, March 20th this year. Um, you're able to compare from different sources um, the same, same object. Here is um, a 3D scan of a Robert E. Lee monument in Richmond, Virginia, captured weeks after um, protests, um, Black Lives Matter protests across the city. And you can compare it with a, a previously published scan from another user on Sketchfab made in August 2017. And even simple or incomplete scans. So um, this, this scan was captured with um, a Tango device, which is a slightly older smartphone capturing technology. Um, they can tell a story. And this is a, um, a point cloud of empty shelves in a Whole Foods in New York, captured right at the beginning of the coronavirus pandemic in early 2020, when there was a lot of panic buying. Um, so beyond uh, 3D models acting as self-contained stories or artifacts themselves, um, if those 3D models are made downloadable under open licensing and made accessible via application programming interfaces or APIs, and that's basically how a platform like Sketchfab can talk to other softwares um, through code, uh, it's possible that um, published 3D models can become a library of content for immersive storytellers to draw upon. So there's over half a million downloadable 3D models on Sketchfab, and they can be imported directly into creative software, whether it's Unity or Unreal, um, Spark AR to, to create um, Instagram filters, um, 
really giving people you know a, a head start on telling stories with with 3d content when they they don't create the 3d content themselves perhaps um and here's just a quick demo of um dropping a model um into mozilla hubs um and searching the, the sketchfab repertoire so things are really perfect and all-encompassing and even though 3d capture and online publishing is easier and more affordable uh, than ever. It's still out of reach of many people due to the expense of the equipment. Robert mentioned how expensive the iPhone is. It is very expensive. Uh, and the necessity of a decent internet connection when you want to publish online or view content online, especially high bandwidth content. Um, and typically 3D scans, unless they're well optimized, will be um, high bandwidth content um, uh, in general. So while digital creativity and publishing are perhaps more widespread than ever. These practices still exist uh, within established industry and internet ecosystems. So work needs to be done to, to make space for underrepresented voices to be heard and, and stories to be told. This is just a, a quick snapshot um, you're looking at right now of um, uh, users accessing Sketchfab from around the world. So you can see there are, there are plenty of gaps um, uh, and that's something that I think will improve over time as things get cheaper and um, uh, more accessible even more. So that's where I'll leave it. Thank you for listening. And I hope that's uh, given you an idea of uh, what's happening over at Sketchfab. Thank you, Thomas, for that. Um, Sketchfab.com is where the website to start off everything. Lots of resources there. Um, next up, we're going to Mint from the New York Times, the R&D Lab. They do magical things, amazing things, and we're lucky to have Mint uh, join us to talk about the work there. Thanks, Robert, and hi, everyone. Um, I am super excited to be at ISOJ this year and to be part of this panel. Um, today, I would like to share some of the research work I am doing as a creative technologist at the New York Times uh, research and development team. Well, what is R&D inside a media company uh, and specifically at the New York Times? Uh, we are a small multidisciplinary team of journalists, technologists, designers, engineers, and strategists who are working toward a common mission. And this mission is to explore how uh, to use emerging technologies in the service of journalism. To do that, we work closely with many teams around the company, uh, namely our newsroom, but also product and technology. We currently have active research across various topics like computer vision, spatial computing, uh, media transmission like 5G, and of course, photogrammetry, the area I focus on. So my job here is to help the team uh, develop 3D capture tools, uh, create prototypes, and to integrate our new found process with the newsroom existing workflow. Uh, and one of the goals of journalism is to bear witness to history as faithfully as possible. And this is especially true for uh, visual journalists who put themselves on the front lines in order to document events through photos and videos. And just so you have an idea of how visual journalism has evolved at the times, uh, we published our first issue in 1851, but the photo did not appear on the cover of the newspaper until the early 1900s. And the first color photo was published in 1997. Uh, that is more than 140 years after the first issue came out. Now, photos and videos can be uh, a powerful tool when telling a story, but what if we could break out of this uh, 2D rectangular representation and let readers experience a place the same way the journalists did? And to do that, we have been exploring many 3D capture techniques, uh, and one of the main ones being photogrammetry. And photogrammetry is a process that involves uh, taking hundreds uh, or even thousands of still photographs and using software to stitch them together into a 3D model. Now the software looks for areas of similarity between uh, the photos and then uses parallax to create depth. Um, this is an incredible technique because it allows readers to experience an entire space um, as if they were there. And because the space is uh, fully represented in 3D, we can show it from every angle, uh, we can give, uh, which also give us an entirely new ways to, to frame and guide the story. 
So when we started thinking about how we would embed these 3D models into the Times articles, uh, we also had to come up with a plan for how the readers would interact with them. And up to that point, uh, most interaction models for 3D content would just drop a user into a 3D space and uh, force them to go or where to look. Uh, but we felt that that experience could be disorienting and counterintuitive, especially for someone who might be trying this out for the first time. So our solution was to borrow an interaction we know our readers are most familiar with, scrolling. So um, as readers scroll down the article page, we guide them through the, the 3D space and stopping along the way to highlight the points of interest. The Times has now uh, published multiple environmental photogrammetry models that integrate uh, this and other interaction techniques. Um, what you see here is a walkthrough of the Diversity Plaza um, in Jackson Heights in Queens, uh, which follows the scroll to navigate paradigm that I just mentioned. And this is Doria Street, a historic part of New York City's uh, Chinatown. In this story, uh, we, we also use the same scrolling method, uh, but beyond that, we integrated this flat 2D archival photographs into the 3D scene for the first time. Um, and this is another example. This is a house of the e-gamer conglomerate uh, face clan. In this story, we uh, overlaid a miniaturized representation of, of the space um, or a minimap um, that readers can use to navigate as well as the ability to use the arrows um, rather than the continuous scroll. So with each new uh, editorial application of the uh, environmental photogrammetry, there is an opportunity to, to try out new interactions and storytelling techniques. Um, and with the feedback from our readers, we are improving the user experience every time we publish something new. Now, photogrammetry as a technique is not a novelty. Um, other industries like gaming and film have been using it for quite some time to create photorealistic 3D scenes. Uh, what is new to us is the implementation of this technology within the fast paced environment of the uh, new cycle. So I would like to share some exciting things we have been working on that have helped us become more uh, efficient and effective. The first one I have here today is what we call a multi-camera rig. Uh, this rig allows one photographer to take multiple photos at a time, making sure we collect enough data. And the second example I have uh, is called a real-time photo alignment. This let us align photos in real time in the photogrammetry software while, um, while the photographer or the journalist is still at the scene of the event. And last but not least, uh, they see as they scroll through the story, while we discard everything else that is not in the frame of the devices for performance purposes. And yeah, that's all I have for today. Um, thank you for listening. And I hope this quick presentation um, shed some light on how photogram photogrammetry can unlock storytelling possibilities. Um, and I have a feeling that we have, uh, you know, only just begun to scratch the surface of what is possible here. And I cannot wait to see where this industry will be in the near future. Thank you. Thank you, Mint, for that presentation. I was my my face was glued to the screen. I have questions. I'm wowed by the technology. Um, I'm uh, going to pull up Ben to join us next. Um, ben Kramer, someone I've known for many years as an independent freelancer. I want him to follow Mint to kind of show you the spectrum of the New York Times, but also this is accessible from an independent creator's point of view. Uh, ben, take it away. All right, so my name is Ben Kramer, and I want to talk a little bit about some of my own sources of technology and story inspiration within the context of photogrammetry. And I am a, an independent journalism technologist. My interest is really in inexpensive, accessible tools 
accessible kind of being relative, but basically technologies that are available, but that perhaps people don't really know about or they don't know how to use, uh, especially in their respective contexts. So with this in mind, I've done a lot of work, sort of communication, storytelling and journalism work with different organizations around the world, um, including with Robert and his students. And I am also a Journalism 360 ambassador. And within that context, I produced a photogrammetry capture guide, which you can find pretty easily by doing a search for J360 photogrammetry guide. Um, but in that guide, I talk about the capture process. And before I introduce some of the inspirations, um, some of the things that I found really useful in the process of learning photogrammetry and using it, I wanna emphasize the fact that photogrammetry is like a three-dimensional photograph. Now, I'm not talking about like a three-dimensional television, I'm talking about a 3D photograph for a three-dimensional medium. So it's a static reconstruction of something that actually exists in the real world. This is literally how you can digitize the three-dimensional world and bring it into a three-dimensional virtual reality or augmented reality or mixed reality medium. And my introduction to all this actually came out of archeologists and it ended up leading me to Buzzfeed in the end. And what happened here is every summer for the past eight years, I've worked with a team of archeologists in Turkey. And seven years ago, I was interested in, I had been working with drones with the Drone Journalism Lab and Matt Waite, and I was interested in going beyond just photos, going beyond aerial photography. And in the process of exploration and specifically drones in the use of archeology, span I learned about photogrammetry and how archeologists had been using kites and balloons and airplanes to do site surveys. So of course, archeologists had already been using drones for some time and I learned the process. And as you can see here, going from say a drone video capture to a photogrammetric capture, you know, the quality that I was able to get from this drone that I had hacked together at the time um, was really remarkable. And instantly because of my background in journalism, I thought, you know, if archeologists are doing this, why are journalists not doing it? And again, at the time, this was 2014, drone technology was still new. You know, it really came down to hacking together hardware and bits to make this process work, but it did work. And at the time I was all about Sketchfab because this was before VR and the AR boom um, that began in 2015. And so I wrote a paper with my collaborator and mentor, Matt Waite about using specifically drones, but drones and photogrammetry for mapping news events. And I presented this at the Computation Plus Journalism Symposium at the Brown Institute uh, at Columbia in 2014. And I keep saying 2014 because it was really about, this was before VR and AR. It was really about the kind of sketch fab, flat on-screen experience. Um, we didn't even, at the time, uh, we didn't even think about VR to be perfectly honest. Now everything has changed since then. Um, drones are now, you can just buy a, a DJI drone off the shelf and go out and do that kind of work. And it's, the whole process be has become much easier. And now we can, you know, the, here's a VR example um, of the photogrammetry work from that dig site, again, on augmented reality uh, projection. Um, but, you know, where does photogrammetry come from? Because it's been around actually since the mid 1800s as a mathematical process that obviously has greatly aided by computers, but essentially it's a process for surveying. And I bring this up because again, where can you look for inspiration about how to use photogrammetry? And I highly recommend looking at the geospatial surveying world. That's where it came from as a technique for making maps. And so drones, uh, really from the beginning have been all about, you know, making maps and, and making kind of higher than you can get with satellite uh, resolution aerial imagery. Um, so again, surveying applications, landscapes. Um, so there's a lot of environmental story implications right there. Um, one project that I did early on was about the Dandora landfill 
in Nairobi. So again, we have a large space. Um, again, this is actually a Sketchfab screen recording, but this was a project for Vice back in 2014. And we wanted to have a, a three-dimensional reconstruction of the landfill that people could fly around. And that's what we did using uh, a DJI drone and Sketchfab to display the experience in the end. Now, another application is Google Earth. So this actually is more in line with producing a, a two-dimensional video in the end. So if you use Google Earth for fly-throughs, you can use photogrammetry to produce much higher resolution imagery than what satellite imagery is available in Google Earth. So it looks like this. So on the right here in this image, you can see the, the high resolution drone scan that's been overlaid on top of the Google Earth satellite imagery. So if you do photogrammetry with a drone, say, you can produce this kind of uh, imagery that you can then bring into Google Earth for doing video fly-throughs. Another application of the technology is for wildlife documentation and conservation. There's a project called Digital Life that is literally making photogrammetry scans of animals. Duke University does a lot of work uh, around uh, marine life, and they'll use photogrammetry and drones specifically to, uh, to study whales. You can do 3D printing, so sort of digital twinning of real world assets into smaller scale and then sort of scale distribution of, of a single real world object. I think found images is a great place to get started and a great place to think about interesting story ideas. And a great example, this happened very recently with the Mars Perseverance rover that took images as it descended to Mars. And people afterwards, uh, when those images were, were, were released by NASA, made photogrammetry or a photogrammetry model of the Martian surface. Similar in a way, um, in 2014 or 2015, um, dronejournalism.org took drone photos, or actually a drone video that had been captured in the Ukraine of this airport that had been destroyed. And the video, the drone video was meant to be a video, but they, dronejournalism.org and Matthew Schroyer took the video, cut it up into images and processed it into a 3D model of the airport. So again, it's kind of repurposing media that already exists. Um, one quick thing I did at BuzzFeed uh, was scanning uh, or taking images that a reporter had captured of Jeremy Bentham's severed head. And there's also LIDAR data. So the USGS has a lot of LIDAR data that's available. So a lot of environmental models that you can find for free on their website. So, you know, we're kind of talking elevation data, but it's available as point clouds and, and as LIDAR data sets. And the BBC's Hidden Cities, they've done some really interesting work with uh, with point clouds and um, a, as a way to create actually video pieces, so 2D video productions. Um, if you do work with LiDAR data, I highly recommend working with Cloud Compare. And it's a piece of free software that makes it very easy to work with, with LiDAR data. And I'm currently working, as another example, I'm working on a National Science Foundation project that involves uh, LIDAR scans from another archaeological site in Turkey, coincidentally. And we're doing structural analysis work as well as creating virtual tours for students that uh, are, un are unable to travel to Turkey right now because of the pandemic. Thank you, Ben, uh, for that. Um, you always amaze me with new tech and new uh, hacks to help make this um, make this technology evolve and move forward. So thank you for, for your presentation. We'll have more questions in the Q&A section. Uh, next up is Elite from the Washington Post who oversees innovation and has the challenge to figure out, is this technology worth our limited resources or not? Elite, take it away. Hi, everyone. Um, thank you so much for spending some time with us chatting about one of my favorite topics. This is my life every day. It's exactly the kind of panel that I would go to, too. So it's a privilege to be part of this esteemed group. Um, so uh, correct, I oversee innovation and experimental storytelling at The Washington Post. Um, I would love to, uh, you know, I think this progression has been great because you've gotten a little bit of what does it look like to be able to experiment with some of these tools. Accessibility is such a huge thing. 
Uh, what I would love to explore today in this talk is um, how do you choose topics for these kinds of stories? Uh, so that's that's something that I, I think about quite a lot as an editor um, at The Post. Um, our team is called The Lead Lab, so we work on lots of different things in terms of creative storytelling using emerging here. A lot of it is machine learning. How does that help us in reporting behind the scenes? Um, as well as ongoing augmented reality, spatial storytelling, 3D storytelling and models and things like that. Um, you know, in the past, it's been a lot of how do we bring the story to you or how do we place you within the story when we define immersive journalism. But I love the idea of expanding that definition of trying to figure out how do you reach as many people as possible and expand that definition of immersive journalism to however it makes sense for you as a creator. Um, so I want to start with just introducing my team and the people I work with every day, my core team here. I always love to see teams of folks who are working in this space too and how that's structured. Um, so I oversee general strategy, directions, opportunities up ahead for us. If there's partnerships that make sense for emerging tech, I'm the person who spends a lot of time in that. Um, we have uh, our principal creative technologist oversees tech strategy. We have an editor who spends a lot of our time directing what this looks like in terms of collaborating across their newsroom. Um, we have a UX designer whose job is to focus on what does it look and feel like in these experiences of the things that we're doing, whether it's a machine learning driven product that surfaces to our journalists or perhaps um, most of the time stories that our audience can experience or dig into in different ways. We have a front end uh, developer and we also have a data reporter on our team. So you can see our portfolio there at that short link. So um, that definition and the glossary that harkens back to all the definitions and glossary that you've heard from Robert to Mint to Ben and all these different terms that we're using. Um, this is one example of last year trying to figure out how to expand that sense of how do we bring you inside a story. So uh, an incredibly important storyline that continues on through today. Um, so we decided to embark on this partnership with The Pudding, who is this fantastic uh, group of folks who are data visual technologists and really tell the story of, you know, there's a lot of information going around criticizing protests and focusing on riots and things like that from the murder of George Floyd in the Twin Cities last summer that really just kicked off a global movement um, and a lot of attention around that. What we want to clarify really was um, what really happened in the first seven days uh, in the Twin Cities? Has it been covered fairly? So we took 250 social media videos on the ground across the Twin Cities, which is a huge area, and tried to paint a full picture of what this looked like in the first seven or eight days. Um, a lot of it is really peaceful. You can see that, you know, a lot of media outlets, including our own team, has, you know, really unfortunately just focused on, hey, here's the biggest events of that. But protests tell a much bigger story of that on the ground when you have a bird's eye view of what's going on here. Um, so this template, as we kind of figured out, how do we tell the story over time and space in different areas of the Twin Cities in an accessible way? Um, we wanted to use this template and lessons from this kind of format to anything that our visual forensics team might reconstruct in terms of investigations, what happened during the Capitol riot, things like that, that can really inform how we tell complex events with lots of different media going on. Another example of what I think is accessible immersive journalism is bringing the story to you and personalizing it in different ways. So this is a story, this is midway through the pandemic in 2020. So I think this is late November or no, uh, October, perhaps. We decided to partner with Google Earth and use Mapbox in different ways to try to tell you the story of these are unfathomable numbers of deaths from the COVID-19 pandemic. It is really impossible to try to wrap your head around what does that mean in general? What do hundreds of thousands of deaths mean? It's really hard to grasp the rest of our coverage. So we always try to figure out in our editorial strategy, how do you reach as many people as possible? And also how do we make this story relevant to you, especially if we're telling a national story, how do we make that more local no matter where you are? So for this particular story, what we wanted to do was, um, you know, if all the COVID-19 death or COVID deaths happened around your area or in your zip code, here's what that would look like and bring that story home to you. That is also what I consider immersive journalism in different ways. 
Uh, this one is a little bit more fun. Uh, this one is from in January when we were trying to figure out how do we cover the 2021 inauguration. It is going to look so different than in the inauguration in the past. Um, and also trying to figure out how do we tell a story of the Washington Post over time. You know, we have 144 years of history here. Um, and I think it's really fascinating to dig through our own archives to see how history itself tells a story along one storyline. So for this one, what we wanted to do was experiment with spatial thing, um, in desktop and in your using augmented reality. With flat objects, daily profit from Harry Potter has always been something that we love playing with and the concept of what does a talking newspaper look like to you? Um, and how does this look like as galleries? You know, um, so it's something of digging into our own archives of front pages from all the inaugurations that we've ever covered how they're meaningful throughout time, our precedents within that. And also, um, you know, really just trying to play with how do we reach as many people as possible in this space. So here's what it looked like. Uh, here's our inauguration issue in print. So we wanted to incorporate this in print as well. Just a quick QR code, you're able to open this. It sends you right to this link. It'll go ahead and allow you access to your camera. And this is also something that, you know, this is, during the time where we're still in severe lockdown, COVID-19 cases, infection rates are still through the roof. And we're trying to play with the idea of field trips and galleries that are immersive that are brought to you um, in different spaces. One second there, hmm. pardon me. Uh, and really just trying to think through how does that look, um, you know, when we bring exclusive things to you um, and be able to go through galleries and feel like perhaps you're in a field trip or visiting a museum when we don't have access to museums at that point. And this is exclusive as well, kind of looking through our own archives and history and seeing how things have progressed over time. Um, one second, going to get this right back up. I think the last thing that I think is important to think about as you're thinking about, we always have too few resources and too little time to be able to pursue projects. This stuff generally takes a good amount of time and experimentation to perfect. So here are some things that I think of as, uh, as editor in this case, um, is how do we evaluate projects? Generally, you know, we're a scrappy small team. We collaborate a lot across our newsroom, which is a thousand person newsroom also. So trying to figure out a workflow that fits for us. Generally, the majority of our projects is this topic high impact, meaning can we reach a lot of people with this? Is it general interest? Is it something that's very on top of mind for news right now? But, or not, if it's not, could it help us reach a new audience that we're attempting to try to reach, um, haven't been able to in different ways. So uh, that's where it really, really helps to consider diverse perspectives and how do we tell stories differently that are very newsworthy. Um, and also baking in enough time to uh, push the idea with new tech. How can we do this differently? But if not, how do we make this accessible and interesting and creative storytelling in different ways? So you can see how we can use those stories where we could tell the localized story of COVID-19, understanding those death numbers in many different ways, but we wanted to try to incorporate mapping for that. Um, and also the last thing that I encourage everyone as a creator, individual, or working with different teams and organizations is what is your distinct point of view? So um, what is your perspective on this? How does it differentiate from other places and times? So if you're going to use objects to drive a narrative, how is that different from the same person who might scan and look at that same object to tell a similar story? really kind of figuring out what your angle is there is as important as any other project or story that's going to be reported. So I think about that a lot as the post is defining its voice and differentiation as well. Thanks so much. Uh, that's it for me. And this is where you can reach out. Um, and so, so excited to see everything coming from this community as well. Thanks so much. Thank you, Alight. Um, I want to thank Rosenthal for indulging me to be able to have a larger panel than normal because I wanted all these diverse perspectives. And one perspective I wanted to include is how do you create these creators? Uh, Risa from ASU um, has experience in that. Risa, the floor is yours. All right, great. Thank you, Robert. Um, yeah, this panel has been fantastic. I have so many questions as well, but um, that'll come later. 
So I want to talk a little bit about augmented reality because we haven't uh, talked about that too much, more photogrammetry uh, and, and other practices. But um, as Robert said, I'm a professor at the Walter Cronkite School of Journalism at Arizona State University. And um, before that, I was a Washington Post reporter uh, way back um, before I uh, got there, I guess. Um, and was a founding editor of WashingtonPost.com back when the Washington Post was first getting into uh, digital. So back in 1995, and we tried to experiment and do all kinds of things, but of course the technology just wasn't there. In 99, I went over to be the founding editor of uh, and, and vice president of BET, where we created BET.com. And in the last, uh, for the last 14 years, I've been out at Arizona State running uh, an innovation lab at the Walter Cronkite School of Journalism. And um, we've done all kinds of things at our lab. Um, we've done, you know, 360 video. We've done a little bit of photogametry. We work with the USA Today Network on the Pulitzer Prize winning uh, um, project around the border wall uh, that extends across the country. We work with uh, LIDAR and uh, 360 videos to just make that accessible to people. We even, uh, some of my students created a company, a virtual reality company to report on the Southwest and uh, on Mexico. And that employed several students for a few years before it kind of fell apart. We've created a ton of um, smartwatch and, and, and uh, smart uh, phone applications. We've built news games just to try to get that technology out to people and have people play with the news and experiment with, with the news. And um, But for the past three years, I've been kind of obsessed with augmented reality and trying to wrestle that into something that we can create quickly and can be uh, stable and something that our audience uh, can get to and not have any issues with it. Interestingly, back in uh, 2010, I created my first augmented reality app and it cost a mint. Um, uh, I used the same technology that brought uh, Robert Downey Jr. alive on the pages of Esquire magazine. I don't know if any of you saw that. And uh, after getting it up a few weeks later, that company had a change in technology. And unfortunately, the app was not accessible to many people. But I learned um, a whole lot in building that app. And the, the lesson that kind of stayed with me was um, the difficulty in getting uh, augmented reality into the mainstream. And I knew that there would be a challenge, or there was then, and I think still now, a challenge uh, from a hardware and a production standpoint. Um, but I've always had a soft spot for AR more so than VR because uh, it's, you know, it's applicability um, for practical usage by people. If you have your phone, if you have a device of some sort, um, you can get to the content. So every few months, really weeks, it seems like we get these headlines about, is this the year that augmented reality will be adopted by the masses? Are people ready for augmented reality glasses? And I would argue that I think the public has been really jazzed about the idea of augmented reality for a while now. Um, some of you might remember, you know, in 2002, uh, when Minority Report came out and everybody was just buzzing about this whole issue of, you know, a gesture based interface and, you know, contact lenses or some kind of other heads up display where you could get useful information like when there's a sale on t shirts at the Gap or, directions uh, to uh, various places around town or just about anything. You can call your, you know, your buddy from uh, just waving uh, your hand in the air. And so I think people got really excited about it, uh, about it then. And also I think that anyone who's ever walked down the street holding their smartphone up in order to get directions know that um, augmented reality and any type of glasses or heads up display would be a much, much, um, a uh, better um, uh, interface for them, and 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 it's just the way to go. But the the problem, unfortunately, um, the, is that the road to augmented reality has been long, and I think that the public, um, the questions around will the public take to a AR? Will the public, you know, buy these glasses? Will it be this year? Will it be next year? Is really because. I think we have to think about it that the public will embrace augmented reality when there are practical reasons to do so. 
And I raise that because I think with journalists, we rightfully so get really excited about all the wild things that we can do. Um, we look at what the um, hardware uh, companies unveil at their various, you know, sort of developer conferences um, when they outsource it to some firm to create some really cool games and it's seamless and it's cool and things are flying around. And of course, we want to do that too. And the problem is, I think, is that we are too far ahead of our um, consumers in many ways when it comes to augmented reality, um, because we want to create these splashy things, but um, the pipeline um, and the accessibility is just not there. And it's hard for me to, um, to admit that, but that is the case. And I think that journalists should be thinking about over the next few months um, how we can spur adoption of augmented reality and then later on maybe some of these other things by providing content that'll be um, useful to people that will be indispensable to people. Now, you know, we got caught up in the whole splashy AR thing too at my lab. Um, I remember a few years ago, we used uh, Vuforia and Unity to create a, a tribute to the late uh, Senator John McCain. And we built sort of his life story in augmented reality. We built by hand the uh, Naval Academy where he went to school. We even created the um, pond or the lake where his plane was shot down with flames shooting from the, the plane. Um, we even recreated the so-called Hanoi Hilton, uh, where he was held for all those years and tortured and held as a prisoner. We even had the little, you know, North Vietnamese tanks going around it. But the problem with um, doing augmented reality in this way, using Vuforia and Unity and using some other programs, is that with all the libraries and all the you know extra stuff that's put into creating something like this in an accessible platform like unity it just makes for a really um, heavy project a really large file that if you can get it past um, apple particularly if you can get it past their um, uh, requirements into the app store it's just such a large file that when users pull those down in order to view in their space, that they maybe will look at it one time if it's stable, and then they delete it uh, in order to uh, preserve storage space uh, on their application. So what I wanna argue for is, yes, we can do all these things and we should continue to experiment, and particularly with augmented reality, because as that Wall Street Journal headline said, you know, it could be coming to a heads up display or glasses near you soon. And I think that journalists and other lay people, as we think about how do we do some of this interactive stuff, we have to think about, um, yes, those splashy big things that maybe some of the larger corporations can do, the New York Times and the Washington Post and so on and so forth. But we also have to think about how do we spur adoption by creating these killer applications, basically information that the public can use. And I think once we do that and it becomes so indispensable to them that they'll want more, they'll um, look at other things. Um, so if we kind of you know think back to what worked for other devices, um, it was the really simple applications like directions, like a flashlight app, like, um, you know, a Yelp or a, a, an app that told you where you could go uh, find something to eat that really became those things that people wanted all the time and told their friends about, like, you got to start using applications on your smartphone because it'll make your life easier. So what I think we're going to be thinking about a lot this uh, fall coming up and over the summer is how can we create a better pipeline to get um, augmented reality, particularly to people um, and to how to come up with simpler things that will be like fun and useful to folks. You know, you got your glasses on, you're walking around, you can see short restaurant reviews, you can see how many stars, any health inspection, inspection reports. I think those are the type of things. Um, that we can do as journalists to try to get more people to embrace this technology. Um, maybe little hidden gems in our community, uh, the things that make them unique, uh, that news companies uh, can authoritatively talk about and provide that content. Um, directions, again, for getting around a particular part of your city or um, a, a particular uh, uh, 
neighborhoods in your city or getting around campus. That's something at a school as big as Arizona State University. We definitely need to do that. Um, and the other part of it is just the pipeline, um, how to create these things. It's good if you have a big team, but if your students, journalism students and myself, uh, or a small shop, a small newsroom, a radio station, public uh, radio or a PBS station, it's, it's um, challenging to create some of these big projects um, right now. It's getting easier, but it's still challenging. I don't want to spend two thirds of the semester teaching my students a reality kit or Xcode or Java in order to do an augmented reality project. And yes, there are easier tools out there like Apple's Reality Composer or Adobe's Arrow, where you can pretty quickly create something uh, for in AR and then share it to your phone. You can get content from Sketchfab. They thankfully about a year or so ago, made all of their um, uh, assets compatible with Apple's USDZ uh, format, which it was really hard to get things created um, and, and to be able to put into an AR um, project that way. And while it's super easy to do this, I could teach you how to do it in 10 minutes. The, the problem with it is, again, this is unstable. Um, you can't do much. You can't have many interactions. We tried last semester to create a project around COVID, just looking at a few people uh, in the community of Navajo County who had passed away from COVID uh, and to try to create um, avatars of those people. And Reality Composer just couldn't handle it uh, and neither could Arrow. So we're still kind of back there stuck with the pipeline issue um, the technology that we have to create in order to make something that's a little bit more stable. And then, of course, um, you know, how do we provide that uh, to users so that it's easy for them to get uh, to it and, and really be able to enjoy it? Now, um, there are a lot of um, uh, companies uh, that will help you create augmented reality where they have a library or interface in between um, the raw code and what you want to do. And it's pretty easy to learn some of this stuff, but what I found is that the licensing fees make it just very expensive for a university setting or for maybe a, a public uh, media where you can't monetize these projects. So not wanting to be the skunk at the party, but all of this stuff is like really a lot of fun. But I think as journalists uh, and all of us who are in this space, we need to kind of put our heads together to figure out how we can uh, make these things, not the splashy things, but the practical things that all encourage uh, uh, the community, our users, our, our viewers to go out and get these glasses. Now, this might be a problem that we'll be facing sooner rather than later. I mean, everybody's looking at this promo for Apple's um, developer conferences coming up in June and wondering, is this a hint? Are they, are they just glasses or are they trying to say that um, augmented reality or heads up glasses are coming from Apple soon? We know that Facebook is working with Ray-Bans to uh, get some other glasses out there. And there are several um, uh, different types of uh, glasses already in the, the marketplace, but the adoption is not there. Um, we're waiting on 5G, but also I think that we're wait waiting on, the public's waiting on content that will um, be indispensable and that they will want to go through whatever hassle there is to wear these glasses so that they can get it because it's going to make their lives easier. And then they'll tell their friends and they'll tell their friends and so on and so forth. So that's a lot of what I've been um, working on and thinking about lately because I want to do the big projects, but I also want the viewers to be there um, when I do those. Thank you. Thank you, Ritha, for that presentation. As you saw, there's a lot of diverse perspectives and approaches to this new uh, medium, this new storytelling uh, method. And I've got a bunch of questions, and I'm sure you do too. So let's open it up to your questions.
All right, so through the, through the magic of time and pre-recording, we did a costume change and the panel is now back together. And there's a lot of questions that have popped in. I'm hoping the panelists can join me on stage here um, as I review some of the questions. Um, the first question I have uh, comes from Kirat and Mark, who has a similar question. And I'm gonna ask this of Mint and Ben. If you can talk about quickly, uh, could this technology be used for breaking news? How might we use this technology for breaking news? So Mint, why don't we start with you and then we'll follow with Ben. Thanks, Robert. Um, well, this is a question that I get asked a lot, um, not by just friends and family, but also by my colleagues as well. And I'm sure it's on a lot of this amazing panelists' mind as well. Um, well, the short answer is right now, it is very, very hard to share um, breaking news with 3D content, especially large environmental uh, scenes. Um, and you see, as a news organization, like we, we help people understand the world um, through on the ground and, and try to be as faithfully as possible. And every story, um, especially in breaking news, um, at every stage of the process has to be meticulous attention, has to be paid with ethical and editorial challenges um, arising from the breaking news. Um, so th that said, uh, with technology evolving so fast and camera getting better, uh, like you mentioned, Ro uh, Robert, that now we have iPhone with a, a no, sorry, not Robert, Robert or um, a few yeah. of us. Yeah, few, few of you. Uh, that now we have a three D scanning tool in our pocket. So. Uh, that is also one of uh, the research that I am uh, working on at the times and uh, with also with the team at the R&D. Um, so I, I see it right now, 3D scanning is, is a way to offer a new perspective to, to a story. Um, uh, and, you know, to become faster and to catch up with the with technologies that is emerging technologies that is such a moving target. Um, we are constantly like uh, researching and working on um, the tools and streamline the process. Um, like I said, the, the technology is a moving target. It's very difficult, um, but we will knocking those um, challenges off our table. If you see um, our photogrammetry projects uh, before 2019, um, those are like smaller scale uh, um, uh, or like a David Bowie stories. Um, and now we're moving towards uh, large environmental scenes. Um, so we are moving towards a breaking news um, to, to be able to, to, to share the video content. I remember the first time an iPhone was used to capture a breaking news story in our newsroom and the day it ended up on the front page and oh my God, it changed everything. And that reaction is going to continue to change. Ben, you build a lot of this stuff. You got some grants to make some volumetric captures. What's your take to that question in terms of how could you use uh, this for breaking news? So three things come to mind. And I will say that most of the time I'm not working. Actually, I've never worked on a breaking news story. So I've not actually sort of field tested these techniques, but this is what I would do or three ways that I would go about it. The first is I would just skip photogrammetry altogether and go with a LiDAR based iOS device. Um, I can't, because I haven't actually timed this pipeline, I can't say how long it would take to go from, you know, run around with the device to then say uploading it to Sketchfab, but I can guarantee you it would be faster than running through a photogrammetry pipeline. So one, don't do photogrammetry, use LiDAR on an iOS device. The two, second thing is if you wanted to do a photogrammetric process, I would shoot video and basically run around the scene. I mean, again, I say run around because assuming you don't have a lot of time, run around shoot video so that you can then extract frames. Um, so I would do as high resolution video as you can. The third thing that I would, it's less likely to work, but there's a possibility is that, like I mentioned in my talk, you can crowdsource images. So there are projects, a lot of times they have more to do with uh, monuments or you know, museum objects or sort of 
objects, subject matter in an environment that many people have photographed over time. But if there's a breaking news event and a lot of people happen to be there and a lot of people are shooting video on their phones, you could take that footage, their photos, and feed it into a photogrammetric software and see what comes out. So you don't even have to be yeah. there. Yeah, I think I, I, I keep remembering the TED talk done by Blade something or other. He was at uh, the Microsoft and did Photosynth. Uh, if you remember that TED talk and created almost like a photogrammetry before I knew what photogrammetry was, a recreation of archival things out of Flickr, uh, taking photos from Flickr and rebuilding it and putting it together. It's an incredible TED talk. Um, but also some of the watch is actually Tomas's boss uh, the CEO of Sketchfab, who's been doing a scan a day. Uh, so Tomas, to go to you, I want to ask you, um, what is the one piece of advice you would give to someone who's starting out? And then I want to ask uh, Elite, what is the one piece of, of advice you would give to the boss or the manager to have that team explore this stuff with the challenging resources? But Tomas, uh, What's a piece of advice you would give from your perspective? Um, I think the, the, the simplest thing to say is, is to have a go. There, there is no reason really that if um, you have a smartphone with a camera, um, you can grab some open source software, you can open a free Sketchfab account so you can go through the whole process of capture to publishing to trying out things like 3D annotations. Um, or adding audio to your 3D to create kind of a, a 3D story. So definitely um, don't be afraid of it. It's not a, a highly complex, um, you know, um, process really, especially once you get the hang of it. But um, just grab what you have handy. Even your old digital camera that you might have um, will be good enough. You will get some results. Um, and th there are tons and tons of people out there already doing this kind of work. There are huge groups on Facebook, um, photogrammetry groups. You can see what people are producing, catch tips, the, all the tutorials that exist for the software. It's kind of it's kind of ready to go um, uh, if you if you're interested in it. I think. Yeah, the barrier to entry is lower and lower year over year. Uh, I was hoping Apple would announce something uh, in their announcement, but uh, Rita reminds me to calm down that she's talking about in the summer, the developers conference is where they're gonna announce some stuff. Um, but as the barrier of entry lowers a light, as a manager, what's the advice you would give the other managers that wanna start exploring the creation of this stuff? I think that's a good question. I'm going to frame this answer that still speaks to who Tomas was trying to reach just now. Uh, and also their managers, if they're here and they're they're able to see that, but I wanna empower both, um, but basically the same advice here, right? Um, if you can attach your experiment that is very easy to be able to do, because of, there's like a lot of support out there that you could tap into, you could use Sketchfab, you could start with LiDAR as the advice has been given here and attach it to the goal that you know that your company is trying to reach, that your newsroom is trying to reach. Um, you know, a goal that is easy and arching in the future is to be relevant in the future for any newsroom. And that involves learning how to tell stories in different ways to engage different audiences. You know, once upon a time, social media was a scary, unknowable thing that, you know, most newsrooms just did not know how to reach so they assigned maybe interns or like young people to figure it out. And this is also one of those areas where, you know, we're trying to find storytellers who could do different things, knowing the potential now from what those experiments look like. Um, this is something that you can bring, you know, your newsroom into the future and continue evolving with it. The Post started working with photogrammetry in 2014, 15, I think, um, Ben, you mentioned a lot of the experimentation early on then as well. And that was vital because we couldn't start now in 2021 without years of continuing to keep up with the tech every year, looking at WWDC, what are those developments? Is that something that's addition to our new? All those little steps really, really count because it's very easy to fall behind and suddenly look up and everything, you know, we're in Rita's future of just like people are wearing like wearables and it's Minority Report a little bit. There's like more surfaces in which you see news and context and you have no idea how to reach those audiences. It's very, very important to keep up in that way. And I will be a selfish professor and say, we're creating creators, Retha is creating creators and yeah, hire the young ones who know this stuff and had some time uh, to inject them and fuse them into your newsroom to bring up uh, the culture of innovation there. Uh, Retha, I have a question for you that came from Cesar, um, which uh, his question was, 
uh, should technology be at the service of the content or are there cases where storytelling is the means of reaching an audience on its own? That's a common question, I think, a common phrasing that we get, technology first or story first. What's your answer to that kind of debate, if there is one? Uh, and I think um, both Elite and Mitt spoke to this and, and, and Ben as well, that you have to decide when you're telling a story, which technology to use. That's it. You have to kind of think it through. Um, of course, speed is one consideration. We talked about breaking news, but, um, you know, some of the stuff that they do at the Washington Post and New York Times, particularly when you're kind of piecing together what happened with a shooting uh, or a protest or, you know, some of these other things, it really helps people. Until I saw, I think it was the Washington Post, um, you know, review of what happened at the Capitol where you could walk through it. I don't think I had the same amount of appreciation for what went down on January 6th until I saw the orange dot and you can kind of see all the photographs and the movement of people. That really helped me to understand how close they were to our elected officials. So I think that you just have to make that decision based on what story you're trying to tell and how you're helping people to see um, what went on. We couldn't do this 20 years ago or 10 years ago. We can do it now. But, um, you know, I, I always keep in mind our users and remember that so many people don't have, they might have an iPhone, but they may not have the bandwidth, the Wi-Fi, the this and that to see a lot of this stuff, especially with augmented reality, or if they're on a laptop at a home, how many students, millions of students across the United States who couldn't get real simple interactivity and might not be able to see all the amazing stuff that we want to do and we are doing. So we have to kind of weigh them both. Yeah, and one of the things to, to think about is that that's the project that got published. There's a lot of experimentation and playing and, and failures that don't get published or please do not publish them. Uh, but like that culture of learning is really important to get you prepared for the moment to say, this is the story, this is the time, the technology is caught up to this journalistic opportunity. And that's, you, you don't decide that's, now I'm gonna learn in, uh, immersive storytelling. You've got to have been playing and experimenting and failing and succeeding along the way. We have about a minute left. So I'm gonna ask uh, you all to quickly share one resource. And we might not have enough time. So I'm gonna ask you also to tweet out that one resource using the hashtag ISOG2021 with the hashtag immersive. That way it kind of can be found more. Uh, but Rita, we'll go with you and we'll go around the, uh, clockwise. Rita, what's one resource that you would like to share with the community? Even though it pains me, I would say Reality Composer, just because it's quick and easy. If you want to experiment with augmented reality, it takes you just a couple of minutes to learn it. Mint? Um, my resource for photogrammetry tools is iPhone and reality capturing reality, which is the software that you mentioned, Robert. Awesome. Uh, Elite? Uh, this is more in emerging tech in general. One of my favorite newsletters to follow along with um, smart product design in the field is Rashad Patel's Splice newsletter. Um, I will tweet that out as well, but it's it's good inspiration of what other folks are doing in that sort of competitive research. I don't subscribe to that one. I will subscribe once this <laughs> session ends. Uh, Thomas? Um, the open source piece of photogrammetry software that um, I've seen around called Meshroom. I think if you can't afford some of the um, pricier software, then go with Meshroom. It's a great place to start for free. There's a lot, a lot, a lot of free uh, tools and technologies out there. I'll give a plug to IceCloud 3D with like eight photos, browser-based, poof, you can make a model. Ben? Journalism 360 as an educational resource. And I've got a, it's a timeless, what we call it, I guess a timeless photogrammetry capture guide. So it, it won't take you into specific software workflows, but in terms of doing the capture process, it goes into the details. And I would say the community of creators here, that tip I gave about IceCloud, that came from Nani de la Pena, known as the godmother of VR. We all, when this group comes together, we're all like, did you hear about this thing or check out that other thing? We're nerding out together and this community is diverse, and it's important for you to participate and join us as we all define this, this platform, this new medium together. I believe I'm out of time. 
so thank you to this incredible panelist for sharing your insights, for sharing your time. And for those at home, wherever you are around the world, thank you for joining us. Enjoy the rest of Isaj. Thank you so much for this great panel. I, I mean, this was my, I, I was waiting, I was waiting <laughs> here. Actually, I've been waiting for this kind of digital uh, immersiveness since I heard uh, Andy Lipman at, at, at Harvard uh, when I was a Neiman Fellow in 1987. So here's the old man, okay? Uh, <laughs> you know, this was the future and the future is here. So thank you very much, brilliant. Um, okay, so let's let's go on. Uh, tomorrow we're gonna have another great uh, day. So I hope you go now to to the Wonder Room. We're gonna put the link uh, uh, on, on the chat here, and and you can follow uh, the the day tomorrow again with uh, the, another great series of keynote and and workshop. The the workshop will be on on climate change, on, on how to improve the, the coverage of climate change. And uh, we, we're gonna have uh, a, a wonderful program tomorrow. So I see you tomorrow. Thank you very much for participating today.